you know, thousands and thousands of people who head off to church regularly, Catholics all over the world, in all sorts of different places, uh, in all sincerity, wanting to follow God. And I don't want to sound critical of them, but I want to just point out the error of the institution and its teaching. Tim, my, my, my sense of power and authority was very short-lived. Have I done something? No? Back one? Yep. Okay. Well, I'll leave it. Tim, I'll leave it to you to do that if you don't mind, okay? I'll turn the thingy off. It worked once, and I think that's worth a little clap. <laughs> now, last week we were talking... Sorry, not last week. The last time we went through some of these things, we were talking about... Uh, a really strange thing for most, uh, uh, you know, Bible-believing and certainly, uh, you know, non-Catholic people's point of view, and that is what I referred to as Mary worship. To most of us, it comes across as weird, this, uh, you know, preoccupation with Jesus' mother, whereas in the Bible, she holds no such place whatsoever. And the institution almost has a kind of a, a Mary-centric you know, view of worship and of salvation and so on and so on, which is quite strange and unbiblical. But I'm not talking about that tonight. Next slide. Next one. Tonight I want to talk about the Pope. Now, when I say the Pope, I mean, you've got Pope Francis I up there in the top right-hand corner. Looks a little bit shifty, doesn't he? Anyway, Pope Francis up in the top right-hand corner there. And uh, when I say the Pope, I don't just mean him... I mean the institution, the papacy, perhaps we might prefer to call it. And uh, the institution goes back a long, long way. Uh, the Catholics will claim that it goes right back to Peter of the Bible, Peter the Apostle. Uh, most of us that have done any study would challenge that very strongly. At different times in history, there's kind of been no pope or two popes or a bit more. Uh, and certainly to get back much beyond about 300 AD would be very, very difficult to demonstrate in a historical sense. Um, and taking it right back to Peter, it would be extremely difficult to do. And so we challenge that as a, from a start. But when I talk about the Pope, or the papacy perhaps, uh, this is really just an introduction to that topic. Because... Uh, as you're going to see when I finish up tonight, there's actually a, a great long kind of a stretch of information that the Bible has about the institution and about the predictions in the Bible, and they are very, very big predictions. You know, read Revelation chapter 13, chapter 17, and so on, uh, detailing the future back from the Bible perspective of the Roman Catholic Church and its power and influence, particularly in Western Europe and around the world. And so the story of the Pope actually is a very, very big one. And if I were to try and shoehorn every theme and scripture associated with the topic into tonight's talk, I think you'd be asleep about 20 minutes into it. But we are going to start off with this basic theme. Next slide. Now, what's interesting is in the Bible, and the reason I've left the lights on is because I want you to use your Bible as well a little bit tonight. Go to Ephesians just for a moment. There's two great lists of New Testament leaders given to us. Ephesians is one, 1 Corinthians is another, but we'll start with the Ephesian one because that's probably the most straightforward. Uh, verse 8, Ephesians 4 verse 8, uh, Wherefore he saith when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Okay, down to verse 11, we read what the gifts are, and he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And this list here gives five different leadership ministries in the church. Uh, apostles, and we tend to, if I could just define them for you a little bit tonight, we tend to think of apostles as being uh, senior men in the church who have a jurisdiction over a, a big area. I think of in our modern day, people like Pastor Godfrey managing all of Papua New Guinea, about a thousand different centres there, and, and various other characters in our fellowship, Pastor John Kilman and so on. Uh, very apostolic in nature. The next one he gives there is prophets. 
Now, it's not actually prophets in the sense of the gift of prophecy. It's prophets in the sense of public speakers. That's the actual expression. And the idea behind it is that there will be really well-known public speakers right throughout the fellowship who are, you know, they may not necessarily supervise, you know, 100 assemblies or something or other, but they'll be fairly well-known prophets. And some evangelists, I don't think that takes too much, you know, technique to work out, evangelising at the outside, some pastors and teachers. And uh, we tend to think of those as the local leaders in all sorts of local assemblies. And uh, the, the local assembly will sort of organise its leadership on the basis of what it actually needs. You know, there's a, for example, if you're in places like Darwin, anyone been to Darwin Assembly? One or two? There's kind of no house leaders there, but they have prayer leaders. So they're kind of assistant leaders in the church because there's no house meetings. Everyone all lives so close to the hall, you just go to the hall. Um, other places I've been, I mean, I'm, there's you know, lots and lots of places around the world where the individual assemblies uh, organize things slightly differently. They sort of fall within these categories you read off here because that's the longest list we have but without sort of being quite as you know, prescriptive. I and mean, we use the terms house leaders, we use area leaders, we use terms such as um, uh, maybe young people's leaders and so on, another leadership ministry. And of course, all of these things are kind of described here, if you know what I'm saying. Does that make sense? Anyone, I'm not sure, we'll make this interactive. Anyone not sure what I'm saying? You're happy with that, okay. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, as I say, there's another list like that in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. Uh, but elsewhere in the New Testament, we get several other words that get introduced. Uh, bishops and deacons, Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, bishops there, it's not kind of your idea of a guy with a mitred hat on and a, you know, maybe a green cloak or something or other. A bishop simply means an overseer, a supervisor, a superintendent. That's what it means. Uh, episcopos in the Greek, epi is over, and scopos is to scope it out. Okay, episcopos. Check out over the top of. Uh, the other word used there is deacon, from the Greek word dikonos. In other words, it was never actually translated in that sense, dikonos, meaning a servant. Deacon means a servant. In fact, in, in Greek, uh, certainly in Roman culture, using the Greek, uh, they had people that uh, would be in the house. They'd be servants, and they're all dikonoses, wandering around the house, making the beds, cooking dinner tonight, whatever it happened to be. They're servants. In the church, we have servants. Uh, we don't necessarily uh, you know, call them that. We tend to think of them as, as, as leaders within the church in a serving capacity. We think of perhaps house leaders, or maybe they're a reference there to, to uh, team leaders or whatever, and young peoples and so on and so on. Servants. Um, the next one I've just put up there is elders. Whoa, 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 not yet. Don't change it yet. Tim, Tim, thank you. Elders, 1 Timothy 5, verse 17. That's a word that's used throughout the New Testament. And the word elder means presbyteros, and it does actually come from the word meaning an older man. Okay, that's what it comes from, an older man. A presper and then uteros is what it comes from. And the idea of that is that it's a bit of a catch-all, meaning that you're local oversight will generally be older men. That's the gist of it. <clears throat> you know, I don't like to think of myself as old, but there we go. And there are the terms that are used in the Bible. Next slide, Tim, now. But no Pope. And this is really, really important. Because once we sort of develop the idea there's a supreme Pope, in fact, one of his titles is Supreme Pontiff, in the olden days, he used to call it Pontifex Maximus, which was a title which was copied from the Roman emperor, the actual emperor, Pontifex Maximus. The idea being he was the, 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 the Maximus uh, priest, if you like. And so once we get to the idea of a pope, then all of a sudden there's a guy in whom we're suddenly going to invest all sorts of power and authority perhaps way what was ever intended by Jesus Christ when he established the church. Uh, I'll show you a scripture in a moment where Jesus says, you are all brethren. You're all brothers and sisters. I hope the revelation of that hits you one day. We are just all brothers and sisters. That's what we actually are. Uh, people have different jobs but in the Lord, but we're brothers and sisters. 
So there is no Pope in the Bible. And tragically, uh, once you invented the concept of someone like a Pope, and then eventually you call him the Pope and so forth, and you invest all of that uh, authority in him, it leads to an incredible abuse of power and authority, uh, which lasted, uh, according to the scriptures, for over a thousand years, right through what we refer to as the Dark Ages. Uh, today, of course, you and I sit here and we look across at Pope Francis and we say, well, he might be a nice bloke. I don't know. But when you go back through history for the last 2,000 years, far from being nice blokes, there were endless streams of villains right through history, incredibly bad people. Now, not all of them. Some people say, oh, there was a... Even when you talk to Catholics, they'll sometimes say, oh, there were a few bad apples amongst them. Could I ask you perhaps to tell me who the good apples were? Because there's an awful lot of bad ones. Just um, the people who are guilty of all sorts of things. And quite often, even in the Catholic encyclopedias, they'll refer to their, 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 their appalling behaviour in the century in which they lived and so on. And I won't go through that tonight because, again, as I say, if I try and... Uh, fit all that in it'll just make this too long but the basic idea in the bible is there's no pope there isn't a pope there's no high priest in the new testament except jesus christ and that's probably the most fundamental point to grasp out of this next slide so where does the term pope come from next slide it comes from the latin papa which means father okay uh, now there's also a greek expression papas but the bottom line is it means father. Uh, it was adopted, we think, around the fourth century AD. In other words, people before that didn't use that term. And certainly from the ninth century onwards, roughly, that it was kind of a standard term for the guy in charge in Rome, the Pope. And it's always been the Bishop of Rome, the man in charge in Rome. Next. Now, for example, some people say, oh yes, but the Pope himself doesn't call himself the Pope. He never says, one of my titles is the Pope, blah, 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 blah. That's technically true, by the way. He doesn't. Everyone else does, but he doesn't. But how about if you um, were to uh, address him? You know how if you address the President, you say Mr. President or Mr. Prime Minister, whatever it is, how do you address the Pope? His address is Holy Father. That's his basic address. There's two kind of addresses, but that's the basic one. Holy Father or His Holiness. Okay. And both of those have basically been derived from the concept that he's the father. Next slide. Jesus told us, though, in Matthew 23, and they, that is the religious leaders of his day, the Pharisees and so on, they love greetings in the markets and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be ye not called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. So the title of father or the nomination of someone as a religious father is actually strictly forbidden by Jesus Christ. And all the people said. Matthew 23, next slide. We need to move on to what Catholic teaching is about the Pope. And here's a simple summary of what's known as the dogmatic constitution of the church in 1870. Anyone been to St. Peter's in Rome? It's, it's really interesting. When you go through the museum and then back into the, uh, towards the Sistine Chapel area, there's a special section where there's a big like commemorative room of all the different things they decided in 1870. There's a whole bunch of stuff, including a great big box, which has got the original thing in it, whatever it is, I don't know what it is. And uh, all this sort of stuff was decided in 1870 because the Roman Catholic Church had just lost its secular power. Uh, they'd been overrun by the Italians and King uh, Victor Emmanuel had basically sort of kind of made the Vatican like a prison almost. Not exactly, but kind of. And uh, for the next 50 years or so, the Roman Catholic Church, having lost the papal states, they actually used to run the centre of Italy. Having lost the papal states, they were kind of down on the, on the, on the, you know, running on empty sort of thing. And they'd lost all that power. But what they did was they invented all these different things in 1870 to bolster 
the prestige and to some degree the power of what was left of Catholicism. And one of the things they did was they described all these things about the Pope. Uh, the status and authority of the Pope in the Catholic Church was dogmatically defined by the First Vatican Council on the 18th of July, 1870. In its dogmatic constitution, the Council established that, one, Peter was established by Christ as the chief of the apostles and the visible head of the whole church. Is that actually true? Peter was established as the, basically, the head of the church. That's technically not quite true. He was an apostle. He was certainly one of the three guys that Jesus used to take with him, Peter, James and John. And those three went with Jesus to different locations to do different things, we know that. But go over to the book of Galatians just for a moment. Chapter 2 and verse 9. And when James, Cephas and John who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go to the heathen and they unto the circumcision. Now, Paul has gone back to Jerusalem uh, probably about 15 years after Christianity has begun, and he's relating here, he's just remembering what it was like when he went down to Jerusalem and when he met the guys there, and he describes how he met with James, Cephas and John. Cephas is another name for Peter, who seemed to be pillars. And he points out that he doesn't actually say these guys were the pillars. He doesn't even say, as I say, he doesn't say, we met with Peter. He was numero uno, the top banana. No, we met with Peter, James and John, who seemed to be the key guys. That's what he's trying to say. In other words, the early Christian church was not run with a pope. Peter was more often than not out evangelizing around Judea. We know that scripturally. Uh, so it was sort of a team effort that was being conducted here. Uh, number two there, it is a heresy to deny the Roman pontiff is the succession of Peter holding the same primacy as him. Uh, well, okay, I'm a heretic then. It is also heresy to deny that the Pope's authority pertains not only to matters of faith and morals, but also to the discipline and government of the church throughout the world. Uh, no big deal with that. If you're the boss of the Catholic Church, you've got the right, right to call the shots there. Last one. The Roman pontiff, when he speaks ex cathedra, or from the church, or from the position as the Pope, operates with infallibility, and his decisions are unalterable. And uh, I was going to point out in a moment, they're the four basic tenets of the papacy. And uh, the last one in particular is just incredibly inaccurate, historically, practically, and so on. Next slide. How did they draw this particular inference for the leader of the supposed Christian church? They take it from this uh, discussion between Jesus and Peter contained in Matthew 16. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood is not revealed unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say to thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I'll give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And the, at the heart of the Roman Catholic dogma is that uh, because the current Pope is the direct descendant of Peter of the Bible. He therefore enjoys the position as apparently Peter does here. Thou art Peter and upon this rock I'll build my church. Uh, the implication is that Peter was the, the mainstay of the church and the church was built on him. Think about that. The church was built on Peter. You know, in every sort of bone in my body, it's screaming to me, break it up, he's just a bloke. Church is built on Jesus Christ. Next slide. Thou art Peter. I need to just make clear a little Greek uh, section here. Next slide. The word Peter there is the Greek word Petros. It's a masculine word. It means a rock or a stone. It's basically a stone that is chipped off from some other bigger rock. Okay. Uh, next one. And upon this rock, I will build my church. Next slide. The word for rock here is a different word. 
It's derived from it, but it's different. It's the Greek word petra. It's a feminine word, not a masculine word. And it means a mass of rock or a cliff face. That's the basic idea. A mass of rock or a cliff face. Next slide. And I've, used, I've thrown an example here where it says earlier in the gospel in Luke and Matthew, he built his house upon a rock. Uh, it's quite clear that the rock's got to be pretty jolly big to build your house on. Uh, that word there, upon a rock, is the same word. A, a mass of rock, a big, big, big you know, bedrock of some sort. So they're quite different words. So when Jesus says, here, I'm going to build my church upon a, the rock, this rock, it's not a reference to Peter. It's a reference to something else. Next slide. <clears throat> In 1 Corinthians 10, we're told, and they did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Next slide. And here we see where it says rock there at the end. It's, it's Petra, feminine, a mass of rock. It's that same one we saw in the second illustration a moment ago. Go back to Psalm 33, if you will, just for a moment. And the concept of God being our rock is just so embedded, no pun intended, in the Bible that you, you, you almost uh, can't believe that people can miss it. For example, Psalm 31, verse 3, For thou art my rock, speaking of God, and my fortress. Therefore, that for thy name's sake, uh, lead me and guide me. And right through the Old Testament, there's this endless reference to God being the rock for Israel and the rock for his people. New Testament, it tells us, as I say, Corinthians chapter 10, Christ is that rock. That's Christ, clearly. There's no question. It's not Peter. It's not Mary. It's not some other character, John or James. It's Christ. Uh, the Lord is our rock. Uh, next slide, please. So what Jesus is actually saying is, and Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon by Jonah, for flesh and blood is not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. I will, and upon this rock I will build my church. The rock Jesus builds his church on is the revelation that he is the Christ, the Son of God. He's the rock, not a man. And all the people said. Uh, next slide. Now, in terms of this same statement, one of the things that I find intriguing is the claim that, firstly, all modern popes are the successors of Peter and that they claim infallibility and their decisions are unalterable. It would take me pages of slides to show you all the different strange decisions made by popes over the centuries, which were subsequently altered. I think the classic is, is, the, is the pope that uh, uh, disinters his predecessor as a, as a, as a, as a, as a you know, cadaver, dresses him up as a pope, sits him on a little chair, and then has a court procedure to judge him and to say that all the things he did and said on certain topics were wrong. Just astonishing. I mean, one pope says, we're going to do this, 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 this is right, this is right, this is right. The next one, after he's dead, digs him up and pretends to have a court case to say that he's wrong. I mean, as I say, the list of things is just so, so long. Uh, you know, if you uh, perhaps were born back in the 60s or 70s, and there's a few here that are, uh, you might recall that Friday you, were never, you weren't allowed to eat meat, and certainly not Good Friday, uh, there are lots and lots of other odd traditions that have sort of gone by the way uh, as, as time has passed. Next slide, please. In terms of Peter being infallible, if he was so-called the first pope, was he infallible? Uh, Matthew 16, then Peter took him. Now, go to Matthew 16 for a moment where Jesus does talk about thou art Peter and upon this rock. Matthew 16. So you can see that in verse 17 there. Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah. Right. Now, just a couple of verses later, in the same passage, verse 21, from that time Jesus began to show forth unto his disciples how he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. 
And then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offence unto me, for thou savourest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Another translation says, uh, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, and so on and so on. And the point, of course, being that Peter clearly had made an error. He'd said that Jesus ought not to be crucified, and Jesus says, get behind me, you savour not the things that be of God. Clearly something Jesus was unhappy with. Next slide. Perhaps you might look at it and say, well, hang on, that's before Peter even got saved as a Christian over in Acts chapter 2. Uh, so maybe that was his old life before he got saved. But in Galatians chapter 2, we read, when Peter was come to Antioch, so he's, they're now all Christians, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come in, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And Paul points out that uh, Peter had made a massive error in uh, he was eating with all the Gentiles one minute. And when some of the Jewish Christians came into the, the dining room or something, Peter jumped up, grabbed his fish and chips and went to another room, which would be the traditional method that the, uh, you know, the Jews would have followed. And Paul points out here in Galatians, Peter was to be blamed. He made a complete mess of that. Uh, Galatians chapter 2. Next slide. Another curious thing is that Peter, of course, was married. Uh, when you talk with um, folk these days, they will, will undoubtedly point out to you that popes ought not to be married and so forth. Well, if they're following Peter, he was a married man. In Matthew 8, it says, when Jesus was come to Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever. So he was married and he had a mother-in-law. Next slide. In 1 Corinthians 9, now we're now sort of about 30, 25 years later down the track, uh, Paul uh, says here, have we not the power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles and as the brethren of the Lord? And Cephas, Cephas is another name for Peter. There's no question about that. And what Paul's pointing out here is, Paul is explaining to the Christians at Corinth, he said, everywhere we go, we just pay for ourselves. Me and Timothy, we just pay our own bills. And wherever I go somewhere, I work and pay my own bills and I have a bunch of guys with me and they pay our bills and we sort of get on with stuff. He said, but actually, the truth is I'm entitled to uh, go to Corinth and if I had a wife to take her and the church should pay her bills and my bills. That's what he's saying. And uh, he points out that the early Christian church, that's how they did it. Have we not the power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? Now, that's the story, but my point here is very simple. Even 25 years later... Peter is still acknowledged as being married. He's got a wife, very clearly. Next slide. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I'll get you to read this with me for a moment. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, because it's, uh, it sort of now starts to branch into the next phase of the papacy, and that's the predictions about a papacy in the Roman Catholic Church given in the Bible. And they're very, very strong and broad indeed. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul writes here, verse 1, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by the word nor by letter, as if from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. And what Paul's saying is that there are people writing letters back in the days of the Thessalonian church here, and they're writing letters to say, Jesus is back, or he's coming back next Tuesday, or he's coming back next Wednesday, or something or other. And Paul says, I don't want that to rattle you. Don't believe any of it. I had someone this week uh, describe to me how, you know, Jesus was due back. What's today's date, by the way? 15? Okay, he was due back today. There would be a massive war. England was going to be in lockdown. There's this great long list of things supposed to happen that were due to happen for over the last three days. And to the person that sent it to me, that's fine. I'll come and have a chat with you on the 16th and we can discuss it. 
In other words, that's what Paul is saying here. There's an endless group of people. I mean, a couple of years ago, there was a fellow in Taiwan saying Jesus was due back in October, back in that year. Look, there's an endless list of people who will put predictions on dates and uh, years and what have you. And the Bible teaches us that even Jesus himself didn't know when he was returning. He said only his father knew. Uh, so Paul tells the church here, look, just calm down because there's a bunch of stuff that actually hasn't happened yet and it's got to happen before Jesus comes back. Verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Perdition means destruction. Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God remember you not that when I was with yet with you I told you these things in other words Paul what he's doing here is he's saying look guys don't you remember the talks I used to give you about this really powerful man of sin this son of destruction who would come and portray himself as if he was God and so on uh, don't you remember all those talks well that guy hasn't come yet Paul writes this roughly around 65 AD, which that'll do for the moment, 65 AD. And around that time frame, Paul is saying, this hasn't actually happened yet. Verse 6, And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. To withhold there means to, be, to hold something back. Uh, for the mystery of iniquity does already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. The person that's restricting the arrival of this evil man of sin is still in place, but once he's gone and out of the way, that opens the door for the next one, the big man of sin guy. And this is the papacy, which I'm happy to describe to you in, in other terms, but that uh, will, for tonight's discussion, that will, that will be plenty. Uh, verse uh, 8. And when that wicked be revealed, wicked one it is, when that wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And Paul goes on to describe here, he says, this institution, this man of sin, the son of destruction, whatever you want to call it, once uh, he's established, he says, lots and lots of people are going to be happy to follow his lies because they still want to live their old sinful lives. Uh, and Paul says, God will send strong delusion. God will allow that deception to take place so that they will follow exactly that. Next slide. Does that make sense? Yes, okay. Um, 1 Timothy 4, I won't go through it, but now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. And we read a moment ago in 2 Corinthians 2, uh, the last days won't come except that there come a falling away first. So there had to be a massive collapse of genuine Christianity, a drifting away of genuine Christianity, to allow the arrival of this false thing. And uh, we read about it in 2 Thessalonians 2. And now in 1 Timothy, Paul says the spirit is really strong on this. Uh, it says, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry. He goes on to say, commanding to abstain from meat. Forbidding to marry. If you're ever looking for a, a so-called Christian institution which was engaged in that sort of doctrine, it's the Catholic Church. That's all the people said. <clears throat> from around, well, they say from around the 6th century it began, and certainly by the 11th century it was actually in church canon that, you know, not just the Pope, but, but bishops, archbishops, local um, priests and so forth could not marry anymore they're forbidden to get married uh, very very clear forbidding to marry so this is a falling away from the faith departing from the faith back to uh, next slide please 
who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God. Now, you look across to Rome at the moment, you think, well, Francis is not too bad. He doesn't sort of come out saying, yo, yo, I'm God or something or other, does he? He doesn't do that. But when you look back through history over the last 1,600 years, many, many popes effectively did exactly that, claiming complete, uh, you know, um, moral perfection and, and so on and so on which I'll talk about, as I say, I can't talk about it all tonight, but another time, uh, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And uh, you're thinking, hang on, wasn't the temple destroyed back in 70 AD? How can he sh go into the temple of God showing himself he is God? Yes, it was destroyed back in 70 AD. But guess what the Roman Catholic Church built? A replica in Rome, the Sistine Chapel. It's a replica of what they thought the original temple was like. It's another talk for another night. I'll give you the dimensions and what have you on another night, but that's exactly where it comes from. And he sits in the Sistine Chapel and makes pronouncements all about Catholicism and the world and what have you, all over the world, as predicted in the Bible. He sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Next slide. Uh, Pope Francis, by the way, ha has publicly acknowledged that he's chosen very modest titles. Every pope, when he becomes a pope, chooses all these titles, right? Uh, the, there's some sort of obvious ones I might go through. Uh, and this is, but uh, the, the current one, Pope Francis I decided, particularly decided, he would actually shorten them all up and just pick a couple of key ones. He chose eight. These are the official titles of the current pope. Bishop of Rome, Vicar of Jesus Christ, successor of the Prince of the Apostles, Supreme Pontiff of the Universal Church, Primate of Italy. Yeah, I think you think this old primate, you mean like orangutan or something? No, it's a different meaning. Archbishop and Metropolitan of the Roman Province, Sovereign of the Vatican City State, Servant of the Servants of God. And they sound kind of reasonable, don't they? They sound too flamboyant. Other popes over the centuries have chosen things like the son of righteousness. <laughs> you know, whoa, isn't that Jesus Christ? You know, and as I say, we'll go through some next time. But uh, he's been quite modest. But the one I want to point out to you, next slide. Oh, it hardly lights it up. It's the vicar of Jesus Christ. It means I'm here in place of Jesus Christ. And that's, that sort of rings alarm bells to most Christians because... You're kind of not. No man, no single man can claim to be in the place of Jesus Christ. In other words, if you look at me, you see Jesus. That's what he's kind of implying. The old, the, 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 the back, in the, back end of the New Testament, it refers on different occasions to the Antichrist or Antichrists. And that word means instead of or the vicar of Christ. It's almost the same title, uh, which is, of course, very worrying. Next slide. Um, okay, back to where you were reading in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We've just finished up tonight, and I've gone well and truly long enough. Uh, verse 11, uh, For this cause God shall send them a strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation, through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. In other words, the diametrically opposed to this, you know, man of sin and man of destruction and the wicked one and his followers and so on is you Thessalonians who've been saved by the Bible method, sanctification of the spirit. You've been filled with the Holy Spirit and you've been made holy by God. Sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. And if we... Uh, perhaps leave folk with a little thought tonight, it's that even though we're talking about, you know, things such as the papers here, we might talk on other nights about other churches, uh, the solution, how to become a Christian, is actually very clear in the Bible. It's through sanctification of the Spirit. We must receive God's Holy Spirit. The Bible teaches us how to do that. It says that we need to repent, be baptised, and we'll receive the Holy Spirit. The Bible also shows us when we receive the Spirit, we speak in other tongues. That's the sign that we have the Holy Spirit. All the people said. Leave you those thoughts there. Just worrying a tiny bit, we might be frying you with those heaters at the back.